kingdom of heaven is like a lamb. Talk about the kingdom of God. We talked about that last week. What does it mean that the kingdom of God is here? It's among us. It's within us. But also the question, what happens when we reject the kingdom of God? Uh, will be our thoughts for today. Um, and it's the rejection of the kingdom of God that leads us then directly to celebrating uh, the communion. I invite you to stand with me as we uh, worship the Lord. For those of you who are our guests, uh, our service is mainly up on, on the uh, screen behind me. And we invite you to follow along. To God be the glory, great things he has done. So loved he the world that he gave us his son. We'll sing the three stands of this comes from. In 1950, a movie was made called The Student Prince. And in that movie, that father of the, st the student prince passed away. And all of a sudden, he needed to take over in governing his people. And then he said, what am I going to do? How am I going to do it? Are the words up there now? Natalie? This is what he said. I walk with God from this day on. His helping hands I lean upon. This is my prayer, my humble plea. May the Lord ever be with me. When I first gave that piece of music to John to play on the organ, he came back to me. He said, that's pretty difficult, right? I can't play that. 
You ought to ask him now. He said, the most beautiful piece I've ever had. So we'll try to, I hope you enjoyed the butts listening to it as we did play it. So this afternoon, I'm going to run home, and I'm going to get to YouTube, and I'm going to watch Mario Lanza sing that. Um, our scripture lesson today is sort of a downer, uh, but it's a lesson for all of us to, uh, to be able to see and understand what it is that God really, truly desires from his people and how he wants to govern us by his grace. And uh, I simply call the sermon The Vineyard. Um, I could have called it the stone rejected. I could have called it just simply the stone. Um, but this is an important lesson for us to learn, especially in our society uh, where the word of God is being uh, degraded, into a, or, yeah, degraded into a place where it really is not the final authority any longer. 
And so we want to hear what the Bible has to say about this. And our scripture lesson then comes from Matthew chapter 21, verses 33 to 46. Chapter 21, 33 to 46. And uh, Lynn is going to read it for us this morning. I invite you to stand with me. The parable of the wicked tenants. Listen to another parable. There was a landlord who planted a vineyard, put a fence around it, dug a wine press in it, and built a watchtower. Then he leased it to tenants and went to another country. When the harvest time had come, he sent his slaves to the tenants to collect his produce. But the tenants seized his slaves and beat one, killed another, and stoned another. Again, he sent other slaves, more than the first, and they treated them in the same way. Finally, he sent his son to them, saying, They will respect my son. But when the tenants saw the son, they said to themselves, This is the heir. Come, let us kill him and, give his and get his inheritance. So they seized him threw him out of the vineyard and killed him. Now when the owner of the vineyard comes, what will he do to those tenants? They said to him, he will put those wretches to a miserable death and lease the vineyard to other tenants who will give him the produce at the harvest time. Jesus said to them, have you never read in the scriptures? The stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. This was the Lord's doing and it is amazing in our eyes. Therefore I tell you, the kingdom of God will be taken away from you and given to a people that produces the fruits of the kingdom. The one who falls on this stone will be broken to pieces and it will crush anyone on whom it falls. When the chief priests and the Pharisees heard his parables, they realized that he was speaking about them. They wanted to arrest him, but they feared the crowds because they regarded him as a prophet. So ends the reading of God's holy word. The parable is one of two that Jesus tells. The first is about a father who has two sons. And the father says to the one son, I'd like you to go to work in the field today. And the son says, uh, no thanks. And so the father goes off to the second son and he says, I'd like you to work in the field today. And the son said, you know what, Pop, I'll do it for you. The first son had second thoughts. And he thought about it and he said, no, I should really do what my father asks. And so he goes and he works in the field for his father. The second son has second thoughts too. He said, why should I work for my father today? I've got these things to do. And therefore he doesn't go. And Jesus asks the question, who of these are, is the true son? <laughs> it's amazing that Jesus, in his storytelling, tells us about life with God. Jesus tells about this parable, a parable which, which seems to make, I mean, really doesn't have all that much implication to us if you think about it, but even the priests and the Levites knew that Jesus was talking about them. Listen. Listen. In Isaiah chapter 5, there's this marvelous song about an unfruitful vineyard. God said, I planted a vineyard. I bought the best stock. I put a gate around it, a gate in it. I put a stone hedge around it so that no one could get at it and so that no harm would come to it. And when I came to look at it again, it was nothing but wild grapes, nothing but wild vines. And God is, of course, talking about the people of Israel who've gone their own way, done their own thing for their own purpose and their own glory. And God smites them 
I mean, he punishes them deeply for that issue. In our parable, Jesus is not alluding to the fruit as much as he does to the caretakers of the vineyard. And I'm sometimes, I wonder if those two are related. That the caretakers of, of the vineyard didn't care really about the vineyard as much as they should have, and therefore the grapes grew wild. Or if in this case, Jesus is saying that those who are taking care of the vineyard are, are taking care of it, but in their own way, for their own pleasure and for their own gain. And therefore, those who are taking care of the vineyard aren't really taking care of the vineyard that the master would like them to do. And so that when he comes for the fruit, they've already made up their mind, this is ours. We've taken care of it. This is our land. This is what we're going to do with it. And this is how we're going to sell it to whoever wants to buy it. The landowner, on the other hand, in both cases, is God. The landowner in this case is the one who says, I'm going to send people to get my, get my fruit. To see how things are going on. To find out if they're doing what they're supposed to be doing. And so the, the first one gets there and, and they beat him up. And they send him home with a message, don't bug us again. He sends another messenger, but this time more. And they do the same thing. Again, they, he sends more messengers. And again, they refuse to listen. And again, they send them away shamefully and kill them. Well, there's only one thing left to do, and that's to send the son. And so he sends his own son to find out how things are going, to talk to them, to make some sense out of this. And Jesus says, when the son got there, they recognized him as the son and decided to kill him. In that way, it be theirs. Jesus is telling a story about the Old Testament people of God. People, people who, who should have known all about God, those who were... <laughs> taken out of a small tribe and brought to the promised land. And through Abram, Isaac, and Jacob, we're able to, to grow this large nation that God brought out of Egypt, out of the house of bondage, and brought them to this fair and wonderful land with the warning that if you ever forget me in this wonderful land, then I'm going to punish you. And so when the people started turning back, he sent judges who brought the people back to God. And after the judges, there came the prophets. And they ridiculed them. They killed them. And after the prophets, God sent, who then shall I send? Except my own son. And the son now standing before the priests and before the Pharisee says, this is what you've done. So now, what do you think the landowner is going to do? What do you think God should do? Is basically his question. And I like the way the RSV says, he's going to come and he's going to put those wretches to a miserable death. He's going to punish them. And it's interesting that they are pronouncing their own judgment. Before them stands the son whom they've rejected, whom they in a few days will put to death. And standing before, the, before them, Jesus nods. And he will lease it to others who are willing to produce the harvest. It's amazing that often we hear the, the story and, and we wonder, what does it really mean? 
but it really means the rejection of Jesus. It means the rejection of what Jesus teaches. It really means, let me put it down as plain dumb as I can, dumb, down dumbing, is that what they call it? dumbing down? Make it as, as simple as I possibly can. It really means that they have rejected the one who perfectly kept the law and lived a perfect righteous life so that we might be able to live a righteous life. They were condemning him to death for living a righteous life. Of course, it happened in 19, uh, sorry, in 70 AD that Jerusalem was sacked and they lost the city, they lost the temple, and people were scattered throughout the world, <clears throat> whether they were Christians or Jews, scattered throughout the world, either rejecting or accepting the good news. And the spiritual blessing says Wearsby, and this surprises me because Wearsby is about as uh, premillennial as they get. Wearsby says, and the gifts and the graces were given to the church. So the prophecy that Jesus talks about has come true. The prophecy of, of them rejecting him, killing him, and the Father coming with judgment. So easy for us, I think, to look at the sins of others than our own. Right? Especially the sins that we know that we're guilty of we're really hard on when other people commit them. Or in Jesus' words, it's so much easier to see the splinter in your neighbor's eye rather than the log in your own. But Jesus is saying here that we need to hear those whom God sends to bring us into the path of the righteousness that God sets before us. We need to hear him speak to us. We need to hear him we need to hear him speak to us in, in, in ways that we are able to obey and follow him. Can I give you a, a great example? It happened this morning. I was telling someone that uh, this morning I woke up and had a dream, or from a dream. And in the dream, I came to church. And as I sat down to read my sermon, I opened the bulletin and behold, there was nothing there. And I woke up because, for me, that is one of the scariest things that can happen on a Sunday morning. I came to church, and I realized I'm here at 8.30. Why in the world am I here so early? And I turned on my computer to print off my sermon, and guess what? It wasn't there. I had such a calm spirit about this whole matter because God had prepared me. And for some odd reason, the spirit in me was listening to what he was saying and preparing me for the morning. We need to listen to God when he speaks to us. Whether it's through a dream, whether it's through the word, whether it's through a friend, we need to listen to what God says. Because otherwise, we're going to end up just like the Pharisees. The Pharisees had no clue. Well, they wanted to kill him, but they really had no clue that in a few days they would succeed. They had no reason to listen to this man who came out of Nazareth of all places. No Messiah ever comes out of Nazareth. This man whom we know, born out of wedlock of all things. And then Jesus, when he hears them, doesn't say, you've answered well. Jesus doesn't say, um, you know, that's what you're going to do to me. No, Jesus says, have you never read the scriptures? Psalm 118, have you never read the scriptures? 
The stone that the builders rejected have become the cornerstone. This is the Lord's doing. It's wonderful in our eyes. He repeats it. He tells them exactly what they're about to do. You're about to kill me. And you're going to destroy everything that God has given you. Now, most modern buildings, um, our building doesn't, but most modern buildings have a cornerstone. And on that cornerstone, they'll put the name of the church or the building and the date that it was erected, uh, maybe even the date that the, uh, the cornerstone was laid and maybe by whom or maybe a scripture verse. And inside those cornerstones, sometimes there's a, a small empty space in which they can put uh, papers or uh, someone can put something of value in there. And then they put that in the building after the building is erected. But in Jesus' day, the cornerstone actually was a cornerstone. Well, it was a capstone. It was really the stone that if you pulled out that stone, the whole house would fall down. I mean, nothing would be left. One stone. They didn't need ball wreckers in those days. They just pulled out the main stone, and the house would collapse. Jesus says, the stone that you have rejected has become the most important stone of all time. That's interesting. Because if that is true, and Jesus is speaking about his time, it's not that he is empty, filled, and valuable that we place within him but rather that he becomes the key to everything that you and I believe, to the very essence of our faith. In other words, we cannot belittle the stone that God gave. In Daniel, there's this marvelous story. Remember Daniel 2? The king has a dream and no one can interpret it except for Daniel, to whom God gives the interpretation. And he sees this large image made of gold and silver and, and other items until he gets down to the feet where there's a, a mixture of clay and, and uh, other stuff. And then all of a sudden, out of the mountain comes a stone cut with no human hand. And he comes, it comes and, and rolls down the mountain and, and it just knocks this thing and grinds it to dust. And Daniel reassures the king, you're the head, you're the gold. And that must make the king feel really good. And whether the king listened to the rest of the story really doesn't matter as long as he was the head. But the stone says, is another kingdom. And that kingdom will come and will crush the nations and it itself will become a great, great kingdom. A kingdom that will not pass away. That stone stands before the Pharisees and the high priests. That stone, Romans 9 talks about, See, I'm laying in Zion a stone that will make people stumble, a rock that will make them fall, and whoever believes in him will not be put to shame. That's a very important line. Whoever believes in him will not be put to shame. You know where that comes from? Anybody? It's a direct quote from Scripture, the Psalms. Whoever believes in him, Paul is bringing this all the way back to the Old Testament. In 1 Peter, Peter writes, Come to him, a living stone, though rejected by mortals, yet chosen and precious in God's sight. And like living stones, let yourselves be built up into a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, to offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. For it stands in Scripture, here you go again, I am laying a stone in Zion, a cornerstone, chosen and precious, and whoever believes in him will never be put to shame. To you then who believe he is precious, 
But to those who do not believe, the stone that the builders have rejected has become the very head of the corner and a stone that will make them stumble and a rock that will make them fall. They stumble because they disobey the word as they are destined to. In other words, the stone for you and I can either become a stone of brokenness or a stone that becomes the head of who we are and what we believe. In other words, the cornerstone, even Jesus, is the one about whom we say there is no other salvation in anyone else. There is no one who can come to the Father except through him. This is the cornerstone of our celebration. This is the cornerstone of our faith. Not just a beautiful, descriptive thing that says, I believe in Jesus. But one that says, Jesus is all the world to me. Jesus is everything. All that I am. All that I ever hope to be. All that will ever be in my future belongs to God because it comes from God and I live it in God. As we celebrate communion this morning, we the church are proclaiming that foundation, that that cornerstone is Jesus we're going to proclaim our faith and our trust in him. Because apart from him, we have no life. Apart from him, we cannot stand before each other or before God. One of the saddest things that ever happened in my life was when my mom moved from... Um, from their home into uh, another neighborhood and they went to a different church. And mom and pa were proud of the fact that they never took communion because they were not good enough. May I tell you that if you're thinking that way this morning, to get rid of that thought right now. Because mom never took communion again in her life. For us, the table is open because God says to you, you're not good enough. That's why I want you to come. But in Jesus, when you trust in Jesus, when, when Jesus is the rock of your salvation, you have his righteousness. You have his holiness. You have his purity. You may not feel that way today, but that's how God sees you. So, beloved in the Lord, the Holy Supper we are about to celebrate is a feast of remembrance, of communion, and of hope. We come in remembrance that our Lord Jesus Christ was sent of the Father into the world to assume our flesh and blood and to fulfill for us all obedience to the divine law, even to the bitter and shameful death on the cross. By his death, resurrection, and ascension, he established a new and eternal covenant of grace and reconciliation that we might be accepted of God and never be forsaken by him. We come to have communion with the same Christ who promises to be with us always, even to the end of the age. In the breaking of the bread, he makes himself known to us as the true heavenly bread that strengthens us to eternal life. In the cup of blessing, he comes to us as the vine in whom we must abide if we are to bear fruit. We come in hope, believing that this bread and this cup are a pledge and foretaste of the feast of love of which we shall partake when his kingdom has fully come. 
when with unveiled face we shall behold him, made like unto him in his glory. Since then by his death, resurrection, and ascension, he has obtained for us the life-giving spirit who unites us all into one body. So we are to receive this supper in true brotherly love, mindful of the communion of saints. We, the elders of Bethel Reformed Church, invite all those who have put their trust in the Lord Jesus Christ as their only way to salvation, and who are members of an evangelical church to come and join us in this as we celebrate this feast. And as we do so, uh, we're going to sing, O Sacred Head Now Wounded, as our hymn of preparation. 